Uh, some of you have never seen Ben Stewart in a suit. I'm not sure Ben has ever seen himself in a suit. But he looked on our website just to, uh, you know, as a, a good minister will do, and say, what's the dress code of where I'm going? And he saw in our chapel speaker lineup that's on our website, everybody had a suit on. So he assumed, I better wear a suit. And so, Ben, we're sorry about that. We know it's probably totally uncomfortable for you. I'm sure you wear one of those every time you're in Reed Arena and, uh, you know, speak like that to the students. But Ben Stewart is uh, one of our grads and a dear friend. He's the executive director of Breakaway uh, Ministry on the campus of A&M at uh, College Station, Texas. Okay, I'll go slower. And then, then once the NM folks get it, you can explain that to the UT folks. And, uh, oh, see? Yeah. <laughs> equal time, equal time. All right. That's it. He has uh, directed this ministry uh, since uh, the summer of 2005. Uh, he grew up in Houston. He graduated from A&M in 1998 and served as a youth pastor in Spring, Texas for five years and then left uh, to pursue a degree in historical theology at Dallas Theological Seminary. He enjoys spending time with his beautiful wife, Donna, and their sweet daughters, Hannah and Sparrow, and his passion in life is knowing God and making him known. Uh, ben represents us as a graduate well in that unique ministry there on the campus of A&M and at other venues in which he represents our Lord. Uh, ben, it's a privilege to have you back on the campus. Would you join me in welcoming Ben Stewart? Well, howdy. Good to see you guys. Uh, it's awesome to be here with you. I'm very grateful. Uh, you know, it's interesting. I, um, when I left DTS as a full-time student to go to Breakaway, uh, the school did a video about Breakaway for DTS. It was awesome. And in it, uh, Dr. Bailey called me a graduate, uh, and I had less than half of my hours. Uh, so it was sweet. I got a call from the university apologizing for calling me a graduate. And I said, that's totally fine. Just send the degree, and we're good. But uh, um, uh, nine years later, I was able to wrap that up. So I'm so, <laughs> so glad. I wish that number was a joke. But... Um, <laughs> I'm glad I made it, and uh, uh, so we're going to talk on perseverance, and uh, I'm just kidding, not, not true, but uh, it's awesome to be here. So uh, if you got a Bible, I want to read you a couple verses from 1 Chronicles 17. Uh, we'll pray and then jump in. It's crazy to see y'all in jeans, too. That's the answer of generations of prayer. Like, I don't know if that's that weird. It's great. Okay. First Chronicles 17, I'm going to jump around a little bit, but let's start in verse 1. It says, Now when David lived in his house, David said to Nathan the prophet, Behold, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is under a tent. And Nathan said to David, Do all that's in your heart, for God is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, It's not you. Who will build me a house to dwell in? in? Verse 11. When your days are fulfilled to walk with your fathers, I'll raise up your offspring after you, one of your own sons. And I'll establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for me, and I'll establish his throne forever. Let me pray for us. Well, Lord, I want to thank you for a few minutes around your word together. And I just want to thank you for every person in here. I, I don't know everybody's story whether they're just thrilled to be here and every day is filled with tears of joy about their exploration of your word or whether they're here exhausted and counting every single hour until they're free. Uh, wherever we land in that, I just thank you you've given us this moment. And I just ask you, Lord, rescue us from just making this the thing we do before lunch. Um, I pray we could honestly and sincerely meet with you, God, and think your thoughts after you and feel 
proper affections in light of that. And so help us. And I want to invite you, if you're willing, to take a minute and ask him that. Just pray and say, God, please teach me something right now. And then if you would, please pray for me that the Lord would use me and I'd be helpful to you. Well, Father, we love you and we trust you. Use this time. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when I entered high school, I had one goal and one goal only, and that was to be great at football. Uh, My dad had been great at football. He had a binder of newspaper clippings of all his exploits on the field. Uh, And my brother had been great at football. He had a similar binder with similar newspaper clippings of all his success. So when I entered high school, I was like, I'm going to have to get out there and uh, kill somebody. I don't know, to uh, sort of earn the family name uh, in football. And so when I got out there freshman year, uh, I weighed 120 pounds. And uh, they put me on the offensive line. I was literally the center of the line. Uh, that's the caliber of ball we were playing. And uh, it was uh, not awesome. Um, but I worked hard over the summer. Uh, and the next year I came back, and uh, after a series of fortunate events, I became the starting cornerback on defense for the junior varsity team. And I was nervous. I mean, the first game I got out there, I was like, come on, you can do this. Believe in yourself. All right. And I got out there and was ready to do this. And I'll never forget the first play they ran a receiver out into my area, and he was huge, and he ran right up to me, and then he turned around to catch the ball, and when the quarterback threw it, he threw it high. So the guy had to extend to get the ball, and so he's just extended out right in front of me, and I'm like, oh no, son. And so I just ran up and tackled him, and I stopped the play, first play of the game. And the whole defense came running up, started hitting me on the helmet, they're like, you did it. And I was like, I did, didn't I, guys? Did I do it? I did, right? And uh, <laughs> They went back and I'm like, okay. And so we got ready the next play and the next play they ran the ball my way and it was a sweep. That's where both running backs run towards you at the same time. One of them to take you out and the other one to run a touchdown. And what they had taught us in that moment was when that happens, you run towards them, you knock the first guy out of the way and then tackle the next one. And I'm like, does that even work? Like, does that make sense? But I just did it. I'm like, okay. And so I just went running at them and the first guy glanced off. There was the second guy looking as surprised as me that I was there. And uh, I grabbed him and shut him down and I stopped the sweep. And I remember I stood up and the whole defense came running over again and they're picking me up. They're like, you did this. I remember at that moment, it was like you could hear the soundtrack kick in behind me, you know? And I was like, I did do this. Like, I play football. It's like, my name is Ben Stewart, people, all right? And it was like, I'm doing it, right? (laughs) Next series, we get out there. First play on defense, they run the ball the opposite direction. I presumed because they were afraid of me at this point. (laughs) So I take my pursuit angle, right? And then all of a sudden, I just see sky, grass, and I'm on the ground, right? (laughs) And I was like, I have no idea what happened. I was like, but that was the hardest dead leg I've ever received in my life. Like my knee was killing me and I wanted to hurry up and get up. I didn't want to be the guy that was laying on the field for like 20 minutes and then pops up and is fine. So I was like, let me get up and the coaches wouldn't let me. And I'll never forget, one of them put his hand on my knee and I let out a stream of cuss words, right? Um, To the point that he was like, it's okay, it's okay, okay, stop, stop it, right? And uh, ambulance, hospital, x-ray, later, Uh, they show me a picture that I had snapped my femur clean in half. Yeah. And uh, I remember sitting there in the hospital room and it landing on me, well, your football career is, uh, it's over. And I remember I was theological enough at that moment to go, God did this to me. God did this to me. And what do you do with that? How do you process that? Now, all of a sudden here, minister, you probably go, well, you just trust God and soldier on, son, right? But uh, (laughs) why do I tell you that story? I tell you for two reasons. There's two pieces in that story that are true of all of us. And the first piece is this, that's true of all of us. We all make plans. All of us make plans. All of us have a vision of our life. Even if we say we don't, which I run into all the time with students, you ask them, hey, what's your plan in life? They're like, I don't, I don't know, man. I'm just, I'm living. You're like, no, really? Like, what's your plan? Where do you want to go? And they're like, I don't know. And so we developed a game a couple of years ago we called Twice Your Age. And it's a simple game. You just ask somebody, how old are you? They'd say, I'm 20. You go, okay, now you're 40. And we would ask them questions and they would answer as if they were 40. 
And it was the funniest thing, because you would ask them before, man, what are your plans when you graduate? I don't know, man, if they're theological, they're like, I'm just trusting the Lord day by day. And you're like, okay, <laughs> let's play a game, twice your age, now you're 40, and then you ask them, you married? Yes. You got kids? Yeah, three. The oldest one is 17. He's uh, five foot nine, about 165 pounds. <laughs> Loves soccer and girls with quirky personalities. I live in Dallas, got a 15 year low interest mortgage on a house near Turtle Creek. You know, and all of a sudden they got tons of detail. <laughs> yeah, I'm an accountant making about this much in this building. I mean, suddenly they got it all mapped out. And you're like, okay, you have a plan. You have a vision of where you believe, expect your life to be. You may not know how you're gonna get from here to there, and that's what makes you say, I don't know. But all of us in here have a picture of where we want our life to be. Everybody makes plans, we all do. A lot of us are here to gather the skills we want to enactuate a dream that's in our hearts, right? We make plans. And David's making plans in this text. He's had a point in his life where a chapter's closed, some of the difficulties and struggles have gone away, and he's got some room to run. And so he goes, what do I want to do in the next phase? And he looks up and he says, I, I got a nice house, and the Ark of the Covenant's in a tent? That doesn't make sense. And, and he's, he's right. This would be a good time to build. The wars have stopped. This is a building phase. And he was, he was right. That's a good call. And so he told wise counsel, he told Nathan, hey man, I'm thinking I want to build this house for the Lord. I think uh, that's the, way, the next step for us. And Nathan gives great advice. He says, do all that's in your heart. Yes, man. So we make plans. David made plans and they're good plans. But in verse three, it says, but that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, go tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, it's not you. It's not you that's going to build this house. And that's the second thing. First thing is, we all make plans. And second thing is, God shoots down plans. <laughs> he does it all the time. And, and honestly, that's the one thing, if we're just really honest in here, that's the thing that scares most of us about really trusting the Lord. Like we're here and some of us, like we, we like the way we study here and, and we feel a sense of control over what we're able to do with the tools we're given. But when we really talk about surrendering your life to what God's gonna do, we wanna, we wanna negotiate right? We want to say, yeah, God, I'll trust you with my life if I land at this point by the time I'm 30. I'm influencing this many people, all right? By 35, I'm married to this kind of person with this amount of kids in this order. All right, we kind of have a vision of how we want to map it out, like we're negotiating with him. Like, I'll trust you, God, but only if you give me that, right? That's, we wouldn't say that out loud, but that's how we feel. And so verses like Proverbs 16 scare us. In his heart, a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps, right? And it doesn't say in the heart, the man who's already committed to the Lord fully, God determines his steps, but the guy that's still negotiating, like a free agent, that's like, well, God, I'll trust you, but let's go ahead and get this nailed down in my contract, right? It's like, no, that guy, whatever plans you're making, God determines your steps. God picks where you go. He thwarts the purposes of the people, but his plans live forever. And that can scare us. That, that can be a pretty terrifying thing to go, God, I have a dream, I have a vision, and it's a good one, and you may or may not give it to me. Like, that's a pretty scary thing to think about. And so some of you are like, man, I really regret coming to chapel today. This was not uh, very fun uh, at all. And uh, you go, is that it? Is that the message? Like, hey, guys, God's going to blow up your plants. Amen. All right? And like, uh, <laughs> is that it? Well, no, and that's not where the text ends. And it is scary if you don't dwell in the heart of our Lord very long. But that's not where their story ends, and it's not where God's conversation ends. It doesn't end with a no. He keeps talking. And so what do we do when we have a plan and no guarantee he's going to give it to us? I'd say the first thing we do is we listen. I'd say we listen. When I got a plan and it seems like God's not letting it work, he's not making it happen, he's not getting it across the field, what, what do I do? I, I think we listen. And you see, God begins to talk to David, and he tells him in verse 7, look, I took you from the pasture, from following sheep, to be prince over my people. I've been with you wherever you've gone. I've cut off your enemies. I will make for you a name. I'll appoint a place for my people that they'll dwell and be disturbed no more. I'll subdue their enemies, and then I'm going to build you a house, and then I'm going to give you a son, and that son's going to build a house, and that throne is going to be established forever. And David is in the middle of trying to make his plans work and they're not working. And so he stops and just listens to the Lord. And what happens is God begins to whisper to him, David, your plans may not work out the way you want them to. I have a plan 
and it's a bigger plan, and it's a better plan. And so I think with all of us, when we come to him with our plan, sometimes he's just not going to let things happen. And so what do you do? I think we've got to pull back and we listen to his. Because the truth is, often our plans are ambitious and they're good, but they're too small. I mean, you see that about David? That, that was David's problem. It's not that his plan was too big. God's like, whoa, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of building, David. Like, that's not it. He says, David, you want to build a building, and that's good. And guess what? It's going to happen. But David, I want to build a house. A house that's forever, David. I want to build one that's not going to wear out. Like that building's going to come down. I want to build a temple to the Lord. I want to bring in a Messiah that's going to reign forever. David, I got bigger plans for the nations that I'm looping you into. Listen to me, David. There's a bigger story playing out here. It's not that your plan's too ambitious or too big. It's too small. I want to build a building. Yeah, I want to change a world forever, David. And I'm drawing you up into this, right? And so God will blow up plans, but just wait and listen, right? He does that. John Calvin wanted a quiet life of study. No. <laughs> Martin Luther just wanted to have scholarly dialogue about indulgences. and the... No, man, that's not what we're doing. Billy Graham wanted to be a chaplain. That's all he wanted, man, be a chaplain in the military. He went out and they're like, you're too small. He bulked up a little bit. Went back, got rejected. Last time, he got the mumps, like the week before. And he's like, God, why are you thwarting me? I just want to be a chaplain. And God's like, I know you want to influence the military. I'm going to let you while also preaching the gospel to more people than any other human being ever. So let me just work <laughs> my plan. Yours is too small, right? Oswald Chambers just wanted to start a seminary, man. That was his dream. And he finally got the building, got it set up, right? World War I started. Seminary's over, bro. And so he became a chaplain in Egypt. And people were like, I'm scared. God's going to send me in the middle of nowhere. That's what he did. Oswald Chambers just sent him out in the middle. Of, he was in the desert, like in a tent, right? Preaching sermons to soldiers that his wife wrote down that became my utmost for his highest. One of the best-selling books ever. And God's got a plan. And, and we got plans, and they're not bad. And David doesn't have to apologize for this plan, but God's got bigger ones. And so sometimes when we have ours, it's not wrong to have them, but the trick is to stop and go, okay, God, but let me listen to yours. And by that, I don't necessarily mean close your eyes and listen to a whisper. I mean, what he's unpacking to him is God's plan of redemption through Jesus. That's what he's unpacking to David, that I want to bring people to Christ. I'm going to bring a king who reigns forever, David. I'm drawing you up into a story that goes on forever. I want you to be locked into that, right? And so we keep reading that story. We keep coming around that story. We're reading the Jesus Storybook Bible to our kids, that beautiful little Bible I recommend to all new believers because it tells them the whole Bible story with pictures, and it relates it all to the big story of what God is doing in Jesus. And my oldest is two. She doesn't know what's going on. She's just like, sheep. And you're like, that, that is a sheep, <laughs> yes. But my wife and I are weeping as we read it and just see God has a big story he's working through generations and we get to be a part of that and so it's okay if my vision for this fall didn't shake down it's all right i'm part of a bigger story so i listen to the story and then i rest i rest in the god that's guiding me and i love that about david it says in king david went and he sat before the lord i just love that picture mighty king crown on leader driving just walks in and sits down like a little kid before god calls him the sovereign Lord like 10 times, calls himself your servant. He just says, you know what? You call the ball. You're the one in charge. This is your game. And here I am, and here's all my stuff, and here's all my leadership, here's all of it. I'm just gonna rest that you're guiding this place. Our God is not pocket God. I don't know if you ever saw that game. It came out like right when the iPhone came out. I remember I downloaded it. It's just these little people and you're their God. And basically, all the new updates in the app was how to capriciously torture them. <laughs> and you sit there, and you're like, I'm throwing that guy in the water, burning that guy alive. And after a while, I was like, I don't like how this game makes me feel. This is horrible. <laughs> and some of us, when we hit places in life, we go, God, what are you doing? God, why are you doing this to me? I remember when I first got into ministry, I left A&M. Like most people leave A&M. You're trained when you graduate. You walk out of here, and you take over the world. I mean, that's kind of... That's the resources you got. DTS is kind of like that, right? I mean, you get so many skills here, so many amazing things. You're like, I step off and I blast off into unending influence. That's kind of what we do here. 
And I remember I left and I got a ministry and I remember launching our first ministry event. And I was like, this is going to be insane. I wrote a Bible study that I was like, you're welcome. Like this is, (laughs) you know, like this is happening. I handed out the flyers. I'm like, here it comes. And let me tell you something. I'm not making this up. First event, one kid, one kid showed up. And I'm like, God, what are you, what are you doing? Like, God, what, what's happening here? And for a minute, I thought he was just messing with me. I thought he's like pocket God, you know, like, let's break his leg. Oh, look, he's crying. You're like, let's get one kid. Like, you're like, God, are you? And some of you, maybe you're hitting obstacles financially. You're hitting obstacles in study, your own personal resources. And you're going, God, what are you doing? And you're starting to wonder if he cares. And you used to be careful with that. Keep coming back to the story and see what he's doing in history. He thwarts plans all the time. He frustrates people all the time. But it's because he's got a bigger story and it's good. So he says, David, you're not building a house, but I'm building you a house, David. I'm linking you up to something beautiful, David. And David just sits down and receives that. Yes, that's better. That's a better plan. Right? It is. And the last thing he does is I rest in the sovereignty of God, and then I run in the revealed things. God tells him, you're not the guy building the house, but I'm going to bless your family. I'm going to bless your son. Your son's going to build it. It's going to be amazing. So what did David do? He rose up and says, I'm not the guy building the house, but I'll get it ready for him. And I'll collect as much wood as need to be collected. I'll collect as many materials as need to be collected. God's given me room to run. And the room he's given me, I'm going to run in it. I'm going to go. And I excel at the revealed things. Because the truth is, I think for a lot of us in here, we've got dreams. And and I think for many of us, we're like uh, uh, Joseph. I I think some of you, God has given you dreams. And you're not going to say, like, these are absolutely from the Lord. You don't know. But you go, I think they are. I really believe they are. And I think for a lot of us in here, they're going to happen. Like, God has given you a sense of what he's calling you to. But the reality is we tend to fill it in with the way it's going to get there. And we make that part of the dream. We make that part of the plan, and it's not. And the road to Pharaoh's house leads through Potiphar's house. But often we'll land at Potiphar's and go, why God, Ah," you know, and, uh, and don't do that. You know, don't do that. Get in Potiphar's house and go, okay, this was not the part of the house I anticipated being in, but I'm gonna be faithful in Potiphar's house. And then he get to prison. You know, this is not, the way I would have done this. This does not really pad the resume in the way I wanted, not the internship I was going for, but he was faithful. And when he got to Pharaoh, he was ready. And for me, I remember looking at that one kid, little Austin Baldridge, and I remember I just felt like the Lord said, Ben, do you love me? And I said, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, then feed my sheep. One sheep. And that broke my heart because I realized at that point I didn't love Austin. I wanted to use Austin. And I was mad at Austin that he wasn't 20 Austins or 50 Austins because I wanted to use them to elevate me, to make me feel like I was somebody because I had a thriving ministry. And how can God bless that? How how could he possibly bless that? He, He can't. And so he said, Ben, you don't even deserve the one sheep but I'm asking you, will you love him? And God broke my heart about what ministry is really about. And I got five wonderful years of being buried in the dirt, of just faithfully studying the word of God and explaining it to these sweet little junior high and high school kids. And it was a gift from God. One of them led worship here a couple days ago, Jimmy Needham. And just getting to pour into their life and go, this may be it. God may have put me in the suburbs forever and that's okay. I get God, I get his word, I get faithfulness. And I'll never forget the day I got called to go speak at the thing, you know, the thing with the thousands of people and all that stuff. And I remember pulling up in that parking lot and I remember worshiping God because I was excited about preaching his word there and because I didn't care what they thought about me. And I realized five years of youth ministry did that in me. I needed to be buried, right? And so God's plan is better than mine. It's better than mine. This semester of breakaway, I just wanted to use the basketball arena. That's what we wanted. And they kicked us out for two weeks in a row. I'm like, we got thousands of people coming. Where are we going to put them? This is like the worst thing ever. And I'm like, God, why, why can't we just do a Bible study in the room I want to do it? Like, why does everything have to be so complicated? You know, like... Uh, 
And we were driving around campus one day and just saw a big field in the middle of campus. And we're like, what, do we get? what if we just did it out in a field? And it was this huge endeavor of going, can you even do that? How do you worship God in a field in the middle of campus? Are they going to let us? I had to call it general. And I'm like, this is nuts. And meeting with these people. And at the end of it, we had over 12,000 students come. Never had anything like that before. I mean, what are you all doing here? It's unbelievable. And it was like, it's because God had to blow up my little plan. And I'm okay now. Now I'm, I'm learning. Okay, God, your plan's better. It's not about my little kingdom. It's about your big one. It's not about the little house I want to build for your glory. It's about the house you're building for your glory and that you let us serve in it, that you let David be in the line of the son of David. That's a better deal. And so I remember laying in that hospital bed and thinking, okay, now that football's over, what do I have that's worth anything? And I felt like in that moment, God whispered, it's me. It's me. And what does that mean when you're a sophomore in high school? It means you just go to Bible studies. You know what I mean? You just go, okay, God, I'm yours. Like, whatever you want to do. And start walking with the Lord. And then you do rehab on your leg. And so I spent a year in the trainer's office just breaking scar tissue in my knee, right? And I remember one day this minister came in the room, and he was a campus minister. And he said, hey, Ben, uh, I got this great thing coming. He said, I want to do an outreach to the freshman football team. He said, and here's the deal. I came to the coaches, told them I want to do it. I got to deal with McDonald's. They're going to give us burger, fries, and a drink for a dollar. He said, so I'm going to present it to the team and invite them to all meet in the weight room and get McDonald's. I'll bring it to them, and then I want to share the gospel with them. And he's like, and I asked the coaches. They said it's okay. He said, here's the thing, though. I want to use some older athletes in that process, but the older athletes all practice longer than the freshmen. The freshmen are in the locker room and out before the older guys get in, so none of them can help. And then I realized, oh yeah, there's Ben. You broke your leg. You can't play football anymore. You know, and I'm like, yeah, thanks. It's awesome. And he said, so do you want to help? I'm like, yeah, man, I'm, I'm in. That's fine. So I show up there in my crutches, and I'm handing out fries, and, and then I back up against the wall like, okay, do whatever you plan to do. And I'll never forget, he looked over at me and he goes, well, say something. <laughs> and I went, what? And he goes, somebody's got to share the gospel with these people. Get up there. And I was like, I didn't think that's what help meant. Like, <laughs> hand out sacks of fries. <laughs> but I got up there for the first time in my life and, uh, in front of a crowd of people and presented this story, you know, of, uh, of a humanity that's beautiful in the image of God but broken and devastated in sin. But God sent a hero, son of David, build a kingdom that lasts forever. And just told him that story and invited them to know him. And I remember at the end of it, he walked up, and it was one of those ministries that like hands out cards to, you know, so they can tell you how it went. And he brought up these two stacks of cards. He's like, hey, I think you're going to want these. And uh, one stack were people that said, I want to know more about the Jesus you were talking about. And the other stack was people that said, no, I want him. I want him. And I'll never forget holding those cards and looking down at my leg and going, this is better. This is better. So I, I don't necessarily believe God is going to blow up all your plans. I think he will probably do them in ways you don't expect at all. Right? Uh, but whatever house you want to build for him, he may call you to do that. He may call you to set it up for the next guy. But God's building a house for the son of David. It lasts forever. And he's invited us into that story. And it's better. Let me pray for us. God, I want to thank you for every person you brought here. They, they, we could probably all take turns standing up here talking about the moments you whispered to us to draw us to know you and to cast away all hope that we could be perfect in the sight of God by our own energy and that we need Jesus. And we could tell the story of when you began to move in us through the voice of other people, through encouragement, God, to, to move into a place where we're here now, investing time and energy, deepening in your word so we can share it with the people. And in that, you've been birthing dreams in people's hearts and they've been given ideas. And, and I believe you do that. And, and yet for many of us, I believe what we do is we tend to craft the story where it's glory to you and, and a little bit for us too. Or maybe we just let it kind of move in a way that 
you go, that's not a bad one, but that's a little sideways from what I'm doing. And so God, I pray that we would, in the days you've given us here, make plans, have dreams, but I pray we would chase the Lord and not ministry. I pray we would take our dreams and ministry and put them at the feet of the Lord and sit. Sit down and say, keep telling me the story of what you're doing in Jesus through all of history. I pray we'd believe the voice that you've led us thus far and you will lead us home. And I pray our prayer could be a simple one, that our life would be like David's, that we would fulfill our purpose for our generation and then fall asleep. God, give us that story. May we be faithful with what you've put in front of us. May we rest that you're ruling this place and may we run in your revealed will and may we rejoice when we see what you're doing because you're better. And we love you. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks.